Kevin's half brother, and Yuta. Having explored the region extensively, they formed the North Protocol Land Planting and Agricultural Society, together with Monroe. In 1879, they obtained the second Napoleon concession deed, covering an area of 227 square miles. The society's offer of land for cultivation brought planting enthusiasts. Soon, labor was recruited from nearby Tamil Nadu. They trekked up the same mountain paths as the Rotovans had centuries earlier. It was the time when the planters made their first acquaintance with the Rotovan tribe. Overcoming their initial reluctance and shyness, the tribals taught the planters to build mud and water huts. Over time, the planters came to rely on their expertise regarding wildlife and the outdoors, employing them as guides and watchers that would last many generations till the present day. The early pioneers unsuccessfully experimented with Opsu Kola and a few other crops before finding the elevation and terrain most suitable for tea. In 1880, tea was planted for the first time by E. H. Sharp in Barwadi Estate. Tea is cultivated at elevations ranging from 3,000 to 7,500 feet on slopes of 30 to 45 degrees and does not compete with any other food crop. Its deep running roots bind the soil of Rome, preventing erosion. Rainfall in the region varies from 130 centimeters in the eastern slopes to as much as 700 centimeters on the western slopes facing the Arabian Sea. The wide variation in topography and climatic conditions has contributed to the evolution of a variety of teas. From aromatic and subtle flavors favored by connoisseurs to strong and early brews preferred across traditional households, the teas produced in the Karnam Devan Hills have catered to all tastes. In the early days, food and other essential supplies were transported through miles of wilderness. Consignments often took weeks to reach the plantations. Finally, in 1886, a business connection was established with a merchant in Bodhi. He agreed to provide food and supplies to the plantations and also to transport plantation produce to Tutikor and Hava for export. Boilers and other heavy equipment, weighing many tons, were shipped from England and hauled up the steep slopes. Soon the first tea processing factories were set up. In 1888, the Kanan Devan Planters Association was formed, its main objective being to organize and coordinate life in the plantations. New roads were opened and living conditions improved. The association continues to serve the interests of the party community to this day. However, Life in the plantations was no bed of roses. And in all right, the young bride of a planter, a man who would have so much for her marriage, enchanted by the beauty of the hills, she expressed a desire to be buried there after her death. She died of cholera two days later. Her husband followed her wish. Lacking the hospital, most planters personally adopted their employers using Dr. Short's book, Medicine in India as a guide. But the ever-present threat of malaria and cholera claimed many lives. The appointment of an apothecary in 1890 was therefore a milestone in the history of the plantations. Doctors brought much relief to the community. Full medical care was provided for all workers. By 1894, 26 estates have been registered. However, a standard tea market adversely affected their profits, and the society's lands were widely advertised for sale in Indian and British newspapers. This drew Sir John Willing from Fenway Mulligan Company London to Munai in December 1894. The Fenway group decided to invest in the 
Khan Range as the two estates around the block are collectively known. The local volunteers were offered the option of working for a new company and thus about 127,000 acres came under the umbrella of four days and their subsidiaries on a capital of 1.5 million dollars to the new company was called the Kanak Devan Hills Produce Company. Its area of the team being only about 2,000 acres there. Progress was swift under few layers. The latest technology in communications, transport, and energy was imported. In 1900, a group with possibly the longest in the world was built to link top station first at 6,000 feet with the plains of Brody. In 1902, a wooden wheel was installed, a rudimentary form of transport that consisted of a single wheel mounted on a metallic track with the other wheel on the road. In 1908, a better telephone system, operated by crack phones, was set up to connect all the deep foundations. It remained in use till as recently as 1995. Initially, the planters rode around on horses. The first motorcycle was introduced in Munna in 1909. Soon the monorail was replaced by a light railway. All the machinery and equipment being shipped from the UK. In 1904, the current Devan Hills Produce Company constructed one of India's first hydroelectric powerhouses at Pahimbasa. A second powerhouse came up in 1910 at Pelikana. In several other estates, power was generated using dozen wheels. To cope with the full requirements of a growing workforce, the company opened a rice mill in Trichy, as well as a dairy farm at Kundale for the benefit of the plantations. Land was also given to merchants to settle a bazaar in Munar. Shops selling various goods and provisions opened within reach of the workers' settlements. To raise the tea estates, the pioneers had to recruit migrant workers from Tamil Nadu, who formed the backbone of the planting operations, as local labor was unavailable. In order to create and maintain a permanent workforce, the planters implemented certain essential schemes that are now considered welfare measures. A new plantation culture evolved, resembling in many ways life in the small villages of Tamil Nadu. Free housing was provided across the plantations. Not only were the workers encouraged to bring their families to live with them, but they were often jobs to their wives as two brothers. The lamb was an instant success. Women proved to be efficient pickers, skilled at using their fingers to snap off the tender leaves. Today, Female workers are predominant in the team estates. Two working members also double the income for each family. To make them easy to work, the company introduced crushes where small children could be left in the care of older women while their mothers were at the plantations. Maternity benefits and health care for workers were introduced as early as 1890. All these were the first needs of the industry, and the planters accepted them as such, much before any legislation made them mandatory. Despite all these developmental efforts, care was taken to preserve the ecology of the tea estates. It is reported that when a new project was needed, the company's head office at Glasgow Quay. How will this affect the rainfall in the district? Besides, where will the elephants breed? This incident goes to prove the early planters' respect and love for the environment. It became a company policy that continues to this day. The planters realized soon enough that they could not depend forever on the forests to meet their fuel requirements. Having identified a fast-growing eucalyptus species, a small consignment of seeds was smuggled in from Australia in the stockings of the general manager's wife. 
Today, the stately and extensive eucalyptus plantations in the Tinga states fuel not only the tea factories, but also the employees kitchens. As profits increased, the quality of life in the tea gardens improved. By 1950, some 50 fully equipped tea factories were operational, and Kanan Thewan Tea was a name to be reckoned with in the market. Limited was born. In 1983, 
the freedom of the ancient bedrock nations in India, which were taken over at the time by Tata Team Limited. The advent of Tata Team saw an era of all-round development and innovation within. To eliminate the dependence on the auctions and ensure that teams reached customers in the shortest possible time, a novel scheme was introduced, packaging of teams. This was followed by the setting up of one of Asia's largest tea factories at Chandubarai Estate. Later, an automatic tea factory was constructed at Malibekti, and cultivation of organic tea was introduced at Chandubarai Estate. In particular, the Tata era is remembered for its significant contributions to healthcare, education, and community development, the cornerstones of the group's policy. The General Hospital, the company's main referral facility in Mumbai, was thoroughly modernized. Today, a team of committed medical personnel, assisted by state-of-the-art equipment, provides specialized healthcare not only for the company's employees, but also for thousands of non-company personnel as well. The prestigious High Wing School was built in 1985. A co-educational institution, it is well known for its academic excellence and a holistic approach to education. Later, Shrishti was established, a unique example of compassion and care for the physically and mentally challenged. Here, the differently able children and employees are provided free education, specially tailored to meet their individual needs. They are also taught various vocational skills as part of their reorientation into the mainstream of society. Atulia is a novel concept of creating wealth from waste. Here, differently able students and adults learn the art of producing handmade paper and stationery using natural additives found in the plantations. Aranea is synonymous with creativity. It revives the ancient art of textile dye using organic pigments found in nature. The project turns out a fascinated range of dyed fabrics whose brilliant hues and elegant colors are much sought after by the fashion industry. The production of a high-range strawberry preserve not only allows the employees additional income through strawberry farming, but also generates gainful employment for differently abled youngsters. In a modern plant, they produce a truly delicious preserve using natural ingredients and fresh strawberries. These three projects continue to be administered by the Tatars, proof of their abiding commitment to social welfare. Faced by a prolonged crisis arising from depressed tea prices, in 2005, Tata Tea decided to exit its plantations in order to focus on brands. To safeguard their interest and livelihood, the employees in the plantations in Munar were offered a unique employee buyout scheme, whereby they would become part owners of the business enterprise. Thus, 69% of the shareholding passed into the hands of the employees with the Tatars retaining 18% and 7% with the trust. The remaining 6% are held by ex-employees and others. Once again, the name of the brand changed. The current Devan Hills Plantations Company Private Limited came into being on the 1st of April 2005. It is the first and largest participatory management company in India with 97% of the 12,500 strong workforce, being shareholders. New ideas need innovative implementation. In a radical shift from the past, the company has introduced a bottom-up management plan rather than the traditional top-to-bottom hierarchy. 
a multi-tiered system of committees is in place to advise on the functioning of the company from the divisional level, which is the smallest administrative unit. The workers and staff are each represented by a director on the board. The first worker director, incidentally, was a woman. To help raise the standard of living further and promote independence, self-help groups function effectively in each estate. As the name implies, these groups aim to make the workers self-reliant. Life in the Karnantena Hills has turned a full circle. Today, the third and fourth generations of the early workers who helped to raise the plantations have taken destiny in their own hands. Each employee is now a proud shareholder of the company that their forefathers had helped to build. It is a truly unique philosophy that instills a sense of individual pride and responsibility. The success of this model is steadily reflected in the awards backed by the company in the prestigious Golden Leaf competition that selects the best teams in South India. The Kannan Devan Hills Plantations Company won as many as six awards in the inaugural competition and won four awards in 2007, the maximum won by any organization. The company strives to create a business model that is environment friendly, economically viable, energy efficient, and technologically innovative. Tea remains a favorite and affordable health drink for the common man. It is perhaps the only plant that yields money every week for well over a century. The industry is highly labor intensive providing employment for thousands of unskilled people while earning crucial foreign exchange for the country. During the past century, a distinct plantation culture has evolved in these hills. It reflects a love for the indigenous people, the wildlife, and the ecology of this haunting and beautiful region. This deep sensitivity is ingrained in the fact that the people who own the land for well over a century chose to cultivate only one third of it, preserving and enriching the remaining area as God's own country. It is a place that entices each visitor to build a personal relationship with nature.